How's it going? Welcome to a video from North Coast Workshop. I'm Kev and today's video was meant to be uh, how to change your oil and filter for your car, but sadly this has happened. So the purpose of the video really before I get on to explaining what exactly has gone wrong is to just show you how you can go about fault finding to find out maybe what's wrong if your car goes through a similar thing as this and hopefully then you won't have to replace loads of parts trying to think that every part you change will hopefully fix it. You can just locate the issue straight away and then replace that one part. So long story short for the issue from a car is that for the past two weeks or so now it's been taking a while to start in the morning. It's been turning over and over and over. Eventually it'll spark into light and run fine. It'll run no bother at all. But if you turn the engine off, so if I went into the shop say for 20 minutes then pop back outside, turn the key, it'll start straight away no problem. But if I was to then park the car at night, go in the house and then come back in the morning to start the car, it'll go back to the same. So it'll be turning over and over and over and again then come into life maybe say after about 10 seconds of turning the car over so very annoying thing to have and also there was a very strong smell of fuel in the engine bay around the air intake and the high pressure fuel pump so i would say always have a list of the key facts from the fault that you've got to then show you what parts it could be and also to eliminate any parts that probably won't be responsible for the issue so my facts were the car would take longer to start if it was sat for a longer period of time without the engine running also, the smell of fuel in the engine bay was a lot worse if the car wasn't running as well. I knew the car wasn't misfiring or running badly out on the roads, so when I was driving it, it was running perfectly. And from a quick inspection of the spark plugs, I noticed they were all the correct colour. They were kind of the nice browny kind of colour and they weren't showing any signs of dampness or soot from any excess fuel in the cylinder. So we'll get to the dismantling stage of this engine in a moment, but first of all, I want to show you the things we checked first while it was still fully rebuilt. So although the intake's missing now, the intake usually sits around this front area here. And my first thing to do was to check where the fumes were coming from because I could smell the fumes around this area really strong. So I just wanted to look down with a torch and also had some kitchen roll to try and find if there's any excess fuel sitting somewhere around this area itself. And after several minutes of checking it in great detail and getting a banging sore head at the end of it as well, I couldn't find any leaks that were visible. So next I want to check the injectors to make sure they weren't leaking. Now I bought an endoscope from Amazon, one of the guys on Facebook recommended it to me. And I removed the coils from the top of the engine here, then took out the spark plugs as well and threaded the endoscope down through the spark plug hole into the actual cylinder itself. And I'll show you the clips on screen just now of what it looks like, but you can see the end of the injector in the picture there and there was no fuel that I could see coming out of any of the injectors on all four cylinders. So next was to see if the low pressure fuel pump was working. Now I can't do it just now because I've got no fuel pump up here and exposed fuel lines. If I open the door or turn the ignition on at all there's going to be a fountain of fuel coming out of the engine. So what should happen is when you first unlock your car and open your door you should hear a noise from the fuel pump area at the back of the car. So there's a fuel pump, a low pressure fuel pump in the tank at the back of the car there and you'll hear it slightly prime as you open your driver's door. Then when you turn it to position two on your ignition, you'll then hear the pump priming again, and that is sending fuel up to the car, making sure that there's fuel there ready for it to start and run. So although it all sounded fine from the back of the car, and also when turned the ignition on, I still hear it priming as well, but I still wasn't sure if there's enough fuel getting through up to the front of the engine here and going to the high pressure fuel pumps. I did bear in mind that that might be a thing I've still got to check. Next area to look at was PCV valve system, so it's missing just now. There's a, that usual gunk from short journeys sitting inside there as you can see. But the PCV system should basically hold a good vacuum over the engine. So the test of the PCV system is basically to remove the dipstick. Removing the dipstick will let air into the engine, like it'll give, create a vacuum leak and the engine will begin to run rough, which my engine did. So I put the dipstick back in again, the engine ran smooth, no bother at all. I was pretty confident that although that PCV system is the original 11 year old system, it was still actually doing its job. So after that, I was then onto diagnostics with my OBD11 app and the wee dongle that I plug into the OBD port. And this was to see if the fuel rail pressure was showing correctly or was reading correctly. There's a specified pressure from the ECU, what it's requesting on the fuel rail, and then there's an actual pressure reading as well, which is shown from the sensor on the fuel rail. Now by the screenshots, you'll see that they're pretty much identical. It was asking for 50 and it was receiving 50 bar in pressure. This of course was with the engine running, so when I turned the engine off, it would still show 50 bar pressure. But what I did was I sat in the car and looked at its reading over maybe say 10 minutes or so, and I noticed that the pressure was dropping very, very slowly. So what I did was I jumped out of the car, left it for three hours, came back and then checked the reading again and found that it dropped to just two bar pressure. So it was still specifying that it requested 50 bar pressure, 
but now it's showing just two bar pressure. So this was one of the key indicators now that I knew the fuel rail was losing fuel pressure somewhere around that fuel rail, whether it was on the injector end or towards high pressure fuel pump. So there are supposedly non-return valves along the fuel pressure rail system. It stops basically fuel going away from the injectors and losing pressure. So there should be a constant high pressure at those injectors ready for when you start the car. Now I knew from checking inside the cylinders that there wasn't any fuel or didn't appear to be any fuel leaking out of the injectors on the cylinder end of the injector but now possibly where the injectors meet the fuel rail there could be a leak or that would explain the smell especially from around the intake area. So I now knew that the leak was on the outside of the engine somewhere along the fuel pressure rail. And sadly then that brings us on to dismantling time because I need to track down where exactly this leak was. This has actually been the third time I've had this engine in bits. First time was the turbo went back in 2018. I had to replace the turbo and at the same time I got the cylinder head skimmed as well. So the intake was off, the cylinder head was off, the, the engine was, was in half pretty much. And last November I had a really bad misfire. I was getting on the OBD11 app, I was getting a reading for cylinder 4 misfires up into 10s, 20s, 30s every minute or so. So I needed to get the injector out and get it sent off to get tested along with the other three at the same time. Artec put them through their system to clean them. They also tested them. Turned out cylinder 4 injector was completely shot, so I needed a new injector altogether. So I then received back my three reconditioned injectors plus a brand new one all tested, all new filter baskets put in them, new seals and I popped them back in the engine last November. Car ran brilliantly since then. Now I've got it back in bits again because of this fuel leak and because of the problems with starting. Anyway, what I would say is from last time I did this last year I actually had the whole bumper off and swiveled around all the radiator and the intercooler and the air conditioning unit. I had this access, I could just walk into the front of the engine and work on it a lot easier. A lot of work though doing that. Definitely this time though, top tip is to remove the fans from the radiator. That's them sitting there. If you get them out of the way, it gives you a lot more width in this space here between the engine and the radiator. Just be careful, obviously, that you don't start to damage the radiator because it's fully exposed. There is a lot of general connections, plugs, hoses, clamps. It's just a mess. And you've got to be very, very careful when you're putting it back together that you get everything in place correctly and that you don't nick any wires between the intake and the cylinder head as you're putting the intake back on. You don't want to have anything in behind it. Like I said already, there is a few tutorials already on YouTube that explain kind of how to get the intake off these engines. This is the EA113 engine and then you get EA888 engines which have a very similar setup. Have a look on YouTube if you want to look to see how to get them off, but it's not a job for the faint hearted. It's quite a complex job to do. So once the intake was off, there's the fuel rail there. That's the inlet manifold with the gasket. That's my induction kit and the high pressure fuel pump attached at the bottom there. PCV valve and the front charge pipe there with the diverter valve on the end there. And here's the injectors. So from left to right, cylinder one, two, three, and four. This sort of thing the issue was, was that the seals were perished on the ends of at least two of these injectors by what I'm, I'm seeing. I'm not too sure though, it's hard to tell. Definitely one was showing that it had been perished on the end of the injector. So what's the plan now then? Well, going by the look of the injectors, there's no harm in me putting them off to Artec or the injector clinic. They're experts at doing it. I was considering buying an injector toolkit and also brand new seals to go in the injectors, but the toolkits cost about seven, eight, a hundred quid and the injector seals for one injector, all the seals for that one injector cost 20 quid each. That'd be maybe 150, 180 quid in total just to replace the seals on the injectors myself. When Artec can do all the flow testing, all the filter baskets changed over, brand new seals, all cleaned up, looking brand new again, and returning to me for 150 quid within the week. So it makes sense to put them to the injector clinic instead. So it's been quite a big job so far to try and find the fault and obviously take it apart to get the fault fixed. What's gonna happen now is tomorrow morning, I'm gonna send off those injectors to Artec in the post, give them a phone at the same time to let them know to expect them. Then hopefully within 24, 48 hours, sometimes they can turn around pretty quickly, get them back from Artec and put them back into the car. So you're lucky enough to get the treat to find out in the next minute or so if that's actually worked or not, whereas I just now have not got a clue what happens yet. So I'll see you shortly. 
I forgot to say as well that I'm actually going to clean the inlet valves at the same time as this all being apart because it's worth me doing just now while the intake is off. I haven't got a walnut blaster, that's preferred way I think to clean these, but with a mixture of maybe solvents, maybe brake cleaner and think, I'm going to give it a go and try and clean them up as best as I can. There's also, you've got to make sure that you close the valves before you clean that cylinder, otherwise everything you clean is going to fall inside the cylinder. It's a bit of a hassle, but it's worth me doing now while I've got the engine in bits and the intakes out of the way. I might as well clean them. So I'm afraid I don't have any video footage of me cleaning the inlet valves. I cleaned the runner flaps by taking them out using a Stanley blade and some brake cleaner and they come up pretty well. I also grouped together some plastic cable ties and used them to agitate the carbon deposits along with the use of these picks, especially the one that's hooked. It was really good at getting in behind the back of the inlet valves and taking away the carbon as well. And yes, I taped an empty pen to the end of my hoover and used that to suck out any of the carbon that I managed to loosen and it worked extremely well. Then just soaking the valves with carburetor cleaner, using tissue to soak up the worst of it, and then using the hoover to remove the remainder of the carbon. And the final result was quite good. For a DIY job at home, it turned out not too bad. So welcome back. This is two weeks later now from my initial dismantling of the engine to get the injectors out and sent off to Artec. In that time, I have been down the road to Inverness. It's a two hours trip south to Inverness for a few days with the family and also had my rear alloy wheels refurbished as well because they're quite badly stone chipped. One actually had really bad kind of cracked lacquer effect. That got sorted as well. So now they look perfect again. And thanks to the wheel specialist Inverness for getting them sorted out at such short notice, they managed to take them in on the Monday morning and have them ready for the Tuesday morning. So a 24 hour turnaround to get two wheels sorted. With regards to the engine, got the injectors back from Artec. Had to get one brand new injector so there's now one that is brand new, one that is 12 months old and two that are still original. All flow tested, all cleaned and new seals fitted and then back to myself to pop back into the engine. Putting it all back together was pretty straightforward. I've done it now so many times. There's been, like I think I've said in the previous part of the video, the issue with the turbo and also last year it was badly misfiring. I'm getting the hang of it now and I've also replaced that annoying bracket because I had left it off previously because I thought it'd be a pain to do. But I now know the trick of doing it and it's back on the engine to support the inlet manifold. I know some people leave them off, but I think it's there just to add more support and strength to that manifold. This job itself, I would say it's not just for your kind of casual DIY because I've done it two or three times now. I kind of know what I'm doing, but if I tried to do this first time around, I would not know where to start or how to get it apart. Yeah, it's quite a big task to take on. If you have someone to help you, that's maybe better. If you are doing it, take plenty of photos. Start marking up all the multi-plugs that you take off, all the connections you take off. Maybe wrap mask and tape around them so you see them easier because it's so easy to miss one multi-plug. As you put it all back together, that one multi-plug could get missed and then the car won't start at the end of the assembly. So make sure you take your time keeping all the bolts and the holes they came from and the nuts, etc. And that way it will be a bit easier anyway. So what we'll do now is we're going to start the car. Like I said, it's completely cold. Just came in this morning into the garage. The garage is absolutely freezing, by the way. Don't know what temperature is outside, but the garage is really cold. We'll go start this car just now. Okay. Well, turn that off. So engine's all working fine now. It was those injectors, it was the blue O-rings, which I thought at the start could have been the issue and it turned out it was them after all. So luckily no more smell of fuel. The car's starting first time straight away. It's not losing pressure anymore on the fuel rail. So yeah, I've been fortunate in this sense that it's managed to be a straightforward fix. Hopefully this video helps you in some way if you've had a similar issue or you can use the process of diagnosing what it can and can't be by using the same method. It is handy to have an OBD11 or VCDS if you can. If you haven't, then maybe take it to a garage and get them to diagnose it for you. Anyway, I appreciate you watching. Hit the thumbs up button if you've enjoyed the video and found it useful anyway. Don't forget to subscribe down below as well if you want to catch more videos like this in future from North Coast Workshop. And there's now two videos on the screen that you can click if you want to catch further work on this engine bay that I've done in past videos. One being the coolant change in my engine and the other one being for the high pressure fuel pump cam follower change. So thank you for watching again and I'll catch you later. Cheers.